There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean, the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel, and welcome to my very first indoor Friday Reads from Canada. Since I moved back, um, it's a nice day out, but I just didn't quite have the energy to go too far afield, didn't have the energy to carry my lawn chair, and the one place that I went to that I've never filmed from before, where there's a picnic table, and it's the closest filming location, but I haven't quite yet decided whether I'm allowed to use that picnic table. It seems to be on private property. The wind was just a bit too strong and I didn't want to subject you to um, that sound of the wind blowing through the microphone, through the built-in microphone on my iPad Pro. If anyone has any tips, there's a special word for that. Uh, wind screen, I guess is what it is, but it's just a felt spongy thing I've got over the top. It looks like a big green condom over the tip of my Blue Yeti. Um, but what, is there anything like that for a built-in iPad microphone? So I'm, I'm gonna rely on you smart people to tell me if there's anything that I can get for that because it's it's not that bad. My voice is still audible when the wind blows but I, I don't like it. So today I just thought I felt defeated by the fact that the breeze was pretty strong and I was tired, so here I am. I've trotted everything back indoors and I've got a rather fabulous bookish background, don't you think? My library is growing. I have three more bookshelves like this to get put together. My lovely darling nephew is going to do that for me. There's been many reasons why that hasn't happened yet, but a lot of my books are up, so I'm not in a big hurry. Job news, I did get a new part-time job in Tokyo. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's the work is all still there for me. There's not a whole lot of ESL teaching work in Saskatchewan, and I kind of expected that. But I did find out about another company that I'd never heard of when I was living in Japan for 13 years. It's basically a writing composition service for their Japanese students who want to improve their English prose. So the students, the customers, the customers submit written assignments or any piece of writing and then there is a team of instructors, and I am one of the new ones, starting next week, I think, who will receive the assignments to mark and give comments in a teacherly kind of, this is why this is a mistake, and blah, blah, blah. Adjective, pronoun, all that stuff, I, which is my bag, grammar, English grammar. I love teaching it and trying to explain it and whatnot. So I did the practice test. I needed... I guess I do have one other piece of news which is kind of connected to this. I found the ad for this company about a month or more ago and they one of their requirements was that you had to have a computer with paid antivirus software. So I got my old Mac computer through the moving company. It came to Saskatoon and it worked fine for Zoom but I never had any antivirus software on it. I paid for some, I tried to install it, didn't work, and it ended up just about finishing the poor old eight-year-old computer off. So it is now in the dustbin. And thanks to my lovely parents, I have a brand new laptop. Top of the line, it's not a Mac, because Mac computers are wonderful, but just too darn expensive. But it's a great laptop with paid antivirus software. And as soon as I got it up and running, I applied for the job and within 48 hours I was hired. So, yay. I don't know how much work I will get through this job. It's paid, but you know, get paid by the word and it's however many assignments uh, you take on or you I will take on as many as I possibly can, but I don't don't know yet because I haven't started how much will there be an endless supply? Will there be enough for me to kind of bring my income up to uh, full-time living? And I hope so, but we'll see. Anyway, Life is so, uh, feeling very optimistic about life these days. I've had an excellent reading week. Since I last talked to you, I finished five books. Uh, two of them I was almost finished, but just didn't quite get to uh, last weekend on the farm. So let's start with those and carry on. I finished the memoir by Ellen Cassidy, who is a writer and translator and feminist union activist. I didn't know all the hats she wore until I read her new memoir. It is called Working 9 to 5, A Woman's Movement, A Labor Union, and the, Ic and the Iconic Movie by Ellen Cassidy. 
I finished it in time to interview her. We had a wonderful chat. I love the book. I'm uh, have no make no bones about telling you that I did love it, and I'm gonna do my damnedest to get that video edited and up before next Friday because the book publication date is I think September second. Stay tuned for our chat. The other one I finished, and I'm only going to hold my copy of the book up for a moment because it's one of the god awful, ugly covers. It's the short story collection, The Silken Thread by Cora Sandell. I'm going to put that down and put up the cover of the edition that I wish I had and that I will track down in due course for this book. Um, I gave this four stars. Oh, and by the way, I didn't rate the book by Ellen Cassidy because I just think once I have any kind of a friendly relationship with the writer, I'm not going to give star ratings to their books because nobody will believe me. I will tell you that I enjoyed it very much and that is in lieu of a star rating. I wish to hell I knew Cora Sandell. By the way, if I have any viewers from Norway, you know what I would love? I would love a photograph of Cora Sandell. There's lots of them on the internet, but I would like to have a real one that I could frame, ideally that I could order in the size I want for my wall, because she's one of my favorite writers, and I'd like to kind of make a, a rogues gallery of some of my favorite writers. I have found some of Barbara Pym that I can order that would be, you know, actual gorgeous photographic paper, you know, a real, not, not just some inkjet print jobby, but a real photograph. And I'm looking for one of Edna O'Brien because the only one I can find of her I don't really like. So any, any help, any of you work at a f literary photographic archive, <laughs> help me out. <laughs> anyway, I really enjoyed this. I give it four stars because it wasn't as strong as her novels, the Alberta Trilogy were, but there was a whole bunch of five star stories in here. The first one was one that uh, actually had Alberta as a protagonist and I would be very curious to know if it was an outtake, so a scene that she didn't end up including in the novel. It was from the childhood era of Alberta's life so it would have been Alberta and Jacob. Or in fact if it was the story that gave her the germ for the for the novel. I'd, I'd be very curious about that but I loved it and there was quite a few others I loved. A lot of these stories are set in different European countries, a lot of which that seem to correspond to where Alberta lived during the First World War in the Alberta Trilogy, and were about women left behind during the war and being a widow and worrying about your men who have gone to the fight. And they were really well done, and lots about emotionally fraught marriages, which was also part of Alberta, and I suspect Cora Sandell's own experience, uh, although I don't remember if she ever married the father of her son. Anyway, I'm all, that's, an, that's all I'm going to say about the collection. I recommend it very highly, especially if you love the Alberta Trilogy. There was a, a handful of these that didn't work at all for me, and which I usually expect, unless it's by Alice Munro that that, or Mavis Gallant, that that will be the case. There isn't very much else that she has written that has been translated into English, and you know what? There's a biography of her written maybe in the 80s or 70s. I did quite a bit of research on it a few days ago by Darrington Overland, Cora Sandell in Biography. Here's the cover. I'm gonna buy it, and I'm gonna read that. I'm so, I'm so hungry for information about Cora Sandell's own life that I don't read Norwegian. I'm going to Google Translate it page by page, you know, for my own, for just for my own information, for my own curiosity. So that's on my to buy list. And in the fullness of time, I would like to be in a position where I could commission a translator to translate it because I think Cora Sandell should be much more widely read than those silly British novelists. What were they called? The Brontosaurus sisters or something. She is my, one of my literary goddesses. I have a new one to anoint. Thusly, stay tuned later in this broadcast. I have no idea why I've started using the word broadcast in my Friday reads. I'm sure that I will get sick of it soon. As I mentioned last week, I did fit two short books in for Women in Translation Month that were not on my TBR. I could have chosen just one that was a larger book that was on my TBR and I decided, nah, you know, as I've been opening the boxes that have been still coming in from Tokyo, it's like, oh, I forgot about this one, or I have this one, and there was two that I thought, I'm gonna sneak both of them in on the final full week of Women in Translation Month, and I am so glad that I did. 
The first one is a German novel, autofiction, I guess, Christa Wolff's Eulogy for the Living, translated from the German, gorgeously translated from the German by Katie Derbyshire. I have read translations by her before and always been impressed, but this one was particularly impressive. I gave this four stars. Christa Wolff is apparently, I didn't know anything about her, but the blurb says she's one of Germany's most celebrated post-war writers. And she died about 10 years ago, I think. One of the foremost East German writers as well. And this was an unfinished manuscript, her attempt to write about her childhood in Nazi Germany. She was born in a part of what was then Germany, but is now Poland. That wasn't really obvious to me as I was reading. It wasn't until I looked her up on Wikipedia. Yeah, the, the German name for the city where she was born and grew up was Landsberg Anderwarth, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and it is now part of Poland. Gorzo Wilkopolski. Sorry about massacring probably both of those place names. It's written as fiction, apparently. I mean, you, uh, you could read it as straight memoir, too, but it, I, apparently she has changed the names. About her immediate family and her actually her extended family fleeing the city as the German, the Nazi army, abandoned the city and started just screaming over loudspeakers, we're, there's no, there's, we're, we're leaving, you, you should too, get out, get out for your lives, because the Red Army was just on the verge of overtaking this city. Her husband afterwards said that she wrote this in four weeks, and this was the most complete of the something like 30 different attempts she made around in 1971 to uh, memorialize to fictionalize that experience and this is extremely vivid it it doesn't quite work which is why I gave it four instead of five stars but I, I found it really compelling and so one of the ways to really experience it and enjoy it is to know that she didn't think it was complete and to kind of muse on what's missing in the absences but what she's trying to do and I don't think it quite works but it it was still a tremendous reading experience. I really struggled, whether it was a four or a five star read, was to knit together a typical memoir of childhood. And that writing about childhood is completely devoid of all the stuff that usually makes me want to gag when I read prose, fictional or other fictional or nonfiction about childhood. It's, it's a very adult looking back and just with gorgeously crafted sentences that run on sometimes for half a page with just a, a, a profound yet quirky uh, way of bringing her childhood alive. Her relationship with her younger brother and lying to her parents and stealing candy. Her, her parents were grocers, middle class grocers in this town in Brandenburg, Germany, which is now part of Poland as I keep making sure you understand and her very emotionally complicated mother and just very nuanced portrayal of her mother that I thought was masterfully done. She's got that going on here, but she's also tying it all to those few hours when the extended family gets shepherded into a lorry, I guess that's a big truck, by one of the hapless uncles that nobody ever thought could be depended on for anything, but he was the only one that had his shit together enough to get the whole family into the truck. It's, it's kind of a hard book to spoil, but his mom does something that I'm not gonna tell you about, just so you'll read the book, that shocks everybody in the family, but especially her kids, at the moment of departure. And, and that's just absolutely fascinating too. There's a lot of telescoping into the future about what fate befell members of her family who didn't leave, her elderly grandparents and various aunts and uncles like we get the backstory but then we get the front story like we telescoping into the future just in a sentence or two reminded me of Anthony Mara in a constellation of vital phenomena but this is a true story and it just grabs you by the throat because there's some horrible fates that befell a lot of these people so these are Nazi these are supporters of Hitler pro-Nazi um, there is a poem that the that the author wrote that to get the admiration of her SS or SA her Nazi high school teacher that is has anti-Semitic stuff in it. I can certainly tell you that Krista Wolf did let go of all that crap fairly soon after, you know, as she grew up. But she was very much immersed in the pro-Hitler, 
Nazi ide ideology. And so was, to varying degrees, her entire extended family. So it's a weird book to read, but it's in a many ways a really interesting companion volume to uh, this other memoir that I finished early in Women in Translation Month, Natasha Woden's She Came from Mariupol, translated from the German by Alfred Coopers. This was, as you might remember from my Friday Reads a few weeks ago, a Ukrainian-German writer's memoir of finding out what happened to her mother as a, a slave laborer in Germany and all of her extended family. And this is in a way almost on the other side of it because this is about a German family that was living in what right after the war became part of Poland and apparently there was a mass expulsion of them that there's no details about that in here but if you look on her Wikipedia page uh, that caused a lot of um, death and uh, tragedy. So reading these two in the close proximity was a really interesting experience for me and uh, this, I think, is the stronger book. But this one made me want to read more by Krista Wolf. She has written full-length novels and stuff that are translated, and I, I will be seeking those out in due course. Oh, and what about this back cover? Have a look at this. Seagull Books put out the best covers in dust jackets. And now for something completely different. I read... <laughs> I'm going to kill the suspense for my besties and worsties this year. I'm sure this will get the best title award. Sin is a Puppy That Follows You Home by Balaraba Ramat Yakubu, a, Niger a Hausa Nigerian writer. Translated from the Hausa by Aliyu Kamal. This is from the genre of love literature in northern Nigeria. It is the first book by a female writer writing in Hausa to be translated into English. There is Balaraba Ramat Yakabu. And I really enjoyed this. I mean, it was a kind of, it's not a romance. It's really, it's very didactic. It's an Islamic soap opera. <laughs> the novels which took off in, I think, the 1970s within Hausa culture. Uh, were inspired by the popularity of Hindi films, which were very popular in the northern Nigeria. And these novels are kind of inspired by those. It was didactic, it was soap opera-ish, but I found it really compelling. I had to give it four stars because it was just such a page turn, it's short, but, uh, and very judgmental, and it's, you know, got the, 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 the wicked men get punished and so on. Um, but it was gripping the way a soap opera is, and I didn't think that it would appeal to me at all. I really liked it. I mean, it wasn't as satisfying as a full-bodied literary work of literary fiction, but I kept turning the pages, and I thought the translation was excellent, and probably the, the deepest part of my reading experience was that I knew what she was trying to do. It was supposed to be a morality tale. It was supposed to show that when you're greedy and selfish and uh, a cheat and don't look after your wife and kids, no matter how many wives you have, all the marriages are polygamous here. And it's set in modern times. Oh, I should say, actually, the translation is 2012 and it was first published in Hausa in 1990. So it's set contemporary in the late 80s. But getting back to what I was trying to say about being the deepest part of my reading experience is that she was unleashing so much of the Dionysian, greedy, sinful energy in the story that she was spinning that I don't think she ever quite convinced me and I suspect even the female house of writers that she's writing, she was writing the book for there wasn't some joy in all that sinfulness and that yes it, well, everybody got punished who needed to get punished but it was also quite a romp to watch them do all that sinful stuff and that's what kept me turning the pages but it, yeah it was a romp I really liked it I think you should try it I also finished Louise Erdrich's latest novel The Sentence came out last year won I think the National Book Award or one of those Blitzer, one of them. This is a book that has a ghost in it. In fact, it's, it, it, as it's one of its central themes and 
central aspects of the plot and the character development is that there is a ghost in it. It is also a book that is not realistic in many ways. It doesn't just stick within the confines of a, the real, I wouldn't use the word magical realism, but I would say that it uh, stretches far beyond traditional real, modern realistic fiction. It is also a book about books and bookstores, and I have never, I hate those books because they're all terrible. So imagine my surprise that I absolutely love this book. It was a five-star read. It's, pro it's a very strong contender for my book of the year. And it is the second book by Louise Erdrich that I have loved. So she is now in the pantheon of my very most favorite writers. I love this. I can see why it's not for everyone. I uh, I'm aware that Greg of Supposedly Fun had some problems with it. And I haven't had time. I finished this very late last night. And I could have watched his review. Because I always do that with Greg's in particular. But if... If somebody's reviewing a book that I'm about to read or that I'm reading, I, I don't watch it until I'm finished. And I could have gone ahead and watched Greg's review as soon as I put this book down, but instead I watched an interview between the indigenous poet Natalie Diaz and Louise Erdrick about this book. I will put a link to that video in the show notes. It was an hour long. It was really compelling. The video connection, they were talking on Zoom or something like Zoom, and the video connection with Louise was cutting in and out, but the audio was perfect, so you can you can at least listen to it. I loved their conversation, and I will see what Greg and other people said about it uh, after I posted this video. But I can see why this book wouldn't be for everybody. It was... Uh, I loved it almost as much as, and made me, as I was reading it, made me think a lot about my top read of last year, the Australian indigenous novel, The Yield by Tara June Winch, which is the highest praise I know how to give it. It's almost that good. It's certainly my favorite Louise Erdrich novel of the three that I've read. I'm gonna put it down, it's heavy. I think one of the criticisms I remember certain readers having of it was that it was too soon to write about the pandemic, and I don't agree. Uh, Louise Erdrich, from the very first novel I read of hers, I think it's called The Roundhouse, I've thought that her novels are messy, and this one was messy, like, you know, taking that, that it wasn't Henry James that said that the novel is a loose baggy monster, and I often use that phrase, and this is a loose baggy monster uh, to the max, and it all worked for me. It was a disorienting reading experience because it kept shifting gears and jumping all over the place. And that is how Louise Erdrich's mind works, I think. And that is certainly how her novels work. And for the most part, you know, I've never had a bad experience with her. I didn't love The Roundhouse, but I liked it. And then I loved Greg's favorite one, which is why I read it, The Plague of Doves. And I, and I love this one even more. So yes, she's a, she's a messy writer. And if you like loose baggy monster novels, she's your jam. But I also love the disorientation of um, the story was in full swing, and there was this, this the ghost of Flora, the the pretendian. Pretendian is a Canadian word. I don't think it's it's gone beyond in, within Indigenous cultures or political culture beyond Canada. For white folks that want to be Indigenous and fake being Indigenous, and Flora is a pretendian, and all those issues were so fascinatingly explored in this novel as was indigeneity itself. I loved Turkey, the main character, so much. I, I, I miss her already. She was fabulous. I did this as an audio text combo. There might have been a, uh, maybe 10% of it I had listened to because I, I connected so much. Greg got me straightened out with the, the audio narration by Louise Erdrich because I was, wasn't sure about it at first, but once I talked to Greg about it, he gave me the best advice that, you know, it was actually an authentic indigenous accent from that part of America. And then I was glommed right onto it. And so I could actually listen sometimes when I was walking without having the book open, but 90% of it I did, you know, the two in, in, in combination. And uh, I just love Tookie so much. She was so fucked up. <laughs> And she was so beautiful. And if I had time, but I'm looking at how much time I've gone on for, I don't have time. But if I had time, I would read two longish paragraphs to you. But for you, those of you that have read it, and I'll describe them in a non-spoilery way, one of them is about her 
watching her husband, Paul Pollux, straighten feathers. He does some gorgeous uh, indigenous craft work with real feathers. And, and he's, it's quite a process to get them to be straight so he can use them in that craft work. And she's just kind of watching over his shoulder. I think she's in bed watching him at his work table in the same room. And it's just one of the most beautiful, heart-rending paragraphs in the whole book. I love Louise Erdrich's writing. And then juxtapose that with quite a bit later in the book, in the midst of all of the COVID, and this is set in Minneapolis, it, uh, Louise Erdrich, or, uh, a bookstore owner named Louise, is one of the minor characters in the book. Tookie works at that bookstore, while Louise Erdrich has a bookstore in Minneapolis. And so Minneapolis, um, 2019, George, George Floyd, um, all the Black Lives Matter stuff. And that becomes, and that overtakes the plot. So many digressions in that sentence that I lost it. So the other really powerful passage was in the midst of all this stuff about the George Floyd and protest movement that came out of that, that Louise Erdrich has a paragraph at the end of one of the chapters in that section of the novel that just nails Minneapolis, its history, its culture, its bigotry in one of the most breathtaking passages of political prose that I've ever read. And I think that doesn't work for some people, but to me it was perfect because it overtook all of our plots. And she writes about it really vividly and there's so much politics, the police maltreatment of indigenous folks and black folks and anybody who's not white. And all of that starts circulating in a way that's really disruptive and powerful, but everything all, I wouldn't say ties together because that's just not a phrase I would ever use to talk about Louise Erdrich's writer, but everything, bumps up against each other that in a way that for me just it was such a satisfying such a deeply satisfying experience and and then there was so much about books and reading and turkey being in prison because she was in prison at the beginning of the story she was in prison for several years and that part of the story is just madcap crazy um, and so there's about dead bodies and stealing corpses and stuff. But but she 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 gets she reads she reads her heart out in prison once she's able to get books. She, and then she ends up working at Louise's bookstore, and she's just this book maniac. And her relationship with her customers, including Flora, the pretendian, who gets who dies in the middle of a sentence, and there's all this stuff about sentences, and I don't have time to say anymore. I just want you to understand that this was a transformational read for Sean the Book Maniac. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm late to the party. Half of you have read it. I'm looking forward to your comments, because I, I know that some of you didn't get on with it nearly as much as I did, or that you'll only relate to part of what I'm you know, so enthusiastic about. But this was such a Sean book. I loved it with all my heart. <sighs> One last comment. Like the Yield, this is a book I'm going to be rereading for the rest of my life. And my first reread will probably be fairly quickly. All right, so that's what I finished. I got scolded by Natalie, Natalie Marie, when I cut out my few, uh, the last chunk of my Friday reads a couple, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. So I won't do that, but I am going to talk more briefly. I'm going to try to talk briefly about the three books that I'm going to be starting. So I finished five, and I had started books, but all the books I started I have finished. So yeah, only allowed to be reading 15 books, and I've got three empty spaces. So I'm going to start three. Before I get into that, and I know that this is not going to be necessarily short, so this might be one of my longer Friday reads, people. That's why I put timestamps in so you can jump around. A Shorty September is coming soon. Bert and Sean, I, I don't know why I can't keep, because her name is either exactly the same pronunciation as mine or very similar, but it's spelled S-E-S-I-A-N. I always stumble over how to say it out loud. I apologize. And along with the wonderful Heather of Soggy Expat Net, Book Nerd. This is, I think, their second year. So I had already decided that for a variety of reasons, but one of which is that, you know, I haven't been able to read very much this year because I've been so busy. 
and now I'm less busy, but I have this many short books lying around here, and they're all stacked on my coffee table. I'm going to read as many of them as I can before the end of the year. I'm not going to read them exclusively. I do have a few Buddy Read stuff, not much, but and October's coming. So not only them, but I have three or four tomes that I've been reading since many of them since the beginning of January, and I want to read some small books alongside that. So I'll show you the two short books I'm planning to start and then get to the other one that's a more normal length. This is a book I just picked up at the bookstore that one of my subscribers recommended to me, Turning the Tide. It's a strange name for a bookstore, but it's kind of a socially progressive left-wing, like they got lots of fiction. It's not, all, they don't just sell communist stuff. They, they sell a wide variety of stuff, but they're definitely bent left. And I picked up this book that I have wanted to read for a long time. Storying Violence, Unraveling Colonial Narratives in the Stanley Trial. The authors are Gina Starblanket and Dallas Hunt. So the Stanley Trial, this was a crime against an, uh, a young indigenous man in Saskatchewan at, on a farm that would be less than an hour's drive from my parents' farm. It happened well, in August of 2016, where a young indigenous man was shot by a farmer he was in the backseat of a car of possibly drunk indigenous kids. They said they, they were asking for gas. The farmer and his family said they were trying to steal stuff. And uh, Colton Bushy, who was about 20 years old or something, in the backseat was shot dead. And this is about the trial of that white farmer. I think his name is Gerald Stanley, but anyway, yeah. Gerald Stanley. And this is, from an Indigenous perspective, situating that, because he was acquitted, uh, of course. This is Canada. So I need to read this, and especially in light of what's going on, and I, I'm holding my fire for a few more weeks about the Don Dumont situation, but it is quite enraging. You can Google it. I will be commenting or doing something on my channel about it but uh, certainly commenting more about it, but it, it, th th that's what made me think. I need to re-immerse myself. I will say very briefly as well that I have realized, maybe some of you have noticed that I haven't been talking about Canada with such disgust since I moved back, and that's because it feels dif more difficult to do it when I don't live far away. But Canada is as disgusting a shithole country and as racist as I said it was when I lived in Tokyo. And I need to uh, recommit to speaking out about that. So this book is a short but important book about all that stuff. Here I go. This is a whim. Uh, didn't I say pretty much everything I say about myself that it is a general truth I end up contradicting in, in the next seven days. So here's one. I said I never borrow books from the library. <laughs> I borrowed this one, Taxi by Helen Potrebenko. She just died a month ago, August 10th. And I was vaguely aware of her name, but I didn't know much about her, but she died. And so then I found out more about her. And she was a Ukrainian Canadian writer, lived, born in Alberta. Uh, so she died, she was elderly when she died in her eighties, I think maybe older. But she was a feminist writer and a working class writer and is well known for trying to start a union at an indigenous restaurant on Davy Street, one block from where I lived for the last eight years that I was, seven or eight years that I was living in Vancouver. This was before that, but it was a white owned restaurant that specialized in indigenous food. And she was intimately, I don't know if she worked there, I don't know, but she was, uh, a key figure in the union drive that ended up shutting that restaurant down and she's apparently written, written a memoir or an autobiographical novel about that experience. Anyway, I remember the restaurant because it eventually reopened with the same name with indigenous owners, but I never got there. I'm so, by the time I moved to my new apartment that was just across the street, it was gone. However, she is a novelist, and this is one of her most famous books, Taxi, because she was also a taxi driver in Vancouver. So this is her autobiographical novel, 162 pages about being a female taxi driver in probably the 1970s in Vancouver. I'm gonna read it this week. In memory of Helen Potrebenko. And finally, 
This was my other booktube spin book. What was my first one? I've forgotten. Ah, yes, something to answer for. I'm, I'm reading Something to Answer for by Newbie. That's for, I, I, well, I realized after I finished editing the Friday Reads from last week that I edited out Kieran's name, but that's a Zoom chat discussion that's probably going to be filmed next week. I haven't talked to Kieran recently, but I think we're going to film it early in September about Something to Answer for by P.H. Newbie. That was one of my booktube spin books, and this is the other one, a Welsh novel. How interesting, because um, Kieran is Welsh. 20,000 Saints by Fleur David. And this is, is it translated? It is not. It is uh, originally written in English, and I can't remember how I found out about it, but it sounded interesting. The main character is an archeologist who returns to an island, I'm assuming it's off the coast of Wales, where in his childhood his mother disappeared without a trace. So that sounds pretty interesting. Fleur David is a female author. And I believe I found a video of her on YouTube where she pronounced her own name, so I'm pretty sure I've remembered it. Fleur David, so I'm looking forward to getting started with that. And that is what I have to say this week. It's been a great week in many ways, including reading-wise. How about for you? Thanks for watching.